I'm here today with Nishit Srivastav, um, who is a PhD in computer science and psychology from the University of Minnesota, working on uh, one of our grants um, with uh, Paul Schrader, um, who's also at the University of, of Minnesota. Um, and the grant has a really quite intriguing title and quite intriguing substance that we're going to get into in a minute, called Cognitive Foundations of Economic Microfoundations. Um, welcome, Nishit. Hello, nice to be here. Um, what it blew my mind about this proposal um, is that it is looking behind the utility function, I guess, and or behind the and and and, tr and yet not this thing that we never question, right, in economics. And you're thinking that we can do science about this, that we can find out where preferences come from, how people form their preferences, and how people form their estimates of probabilities of things um, as, as as well. So the funny thing is that if you read the early economic textbooks and the early economic um, articles, everybody is very concerned about where preferences come from, come from. And it was only later, at the time of the classical economic revolution, when Paul Samuelson and von Neumann and these other people decided that we don't care where they come from as long as we can represent them and do interesting mathematics with them. So as long as you get something that looks plausible, the fundamental question of preference formation was left behind as being the province of psychologists and philosophers, but not economists. And so there's this epistemic divide. Mm -hmm. And that leads and to... disciplinary divide. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, which is very firmly maintained. Mm -hmm. But a lot of um, problems that people see with the divide between economic theory and reality uh, stems from the fact that a lot of the assumptions that go into making the utility function tractable are not really useful in modeling real world applications. And so what we have is a way of making something that looks like a utility function that does not make any of those assumptions that is still tractable in the same way that econ economists are used to. Mm -hmm. Now this connects up to some of this literature like Kahneman, Tversky and so forth, the people who find anomalies um, in people's behavior where what they mean by an anomaly is when somebody behaves differently than the standard utility assumptions that economists make. Um, so is part of your motivation to find a basis, say well where, do, why do people behave this way? So if you look at the history of the evolution of say physics, before Copernicus came up with this idea of what makes the orbits uh, go the way they go, they had the Ptolemaic idea of epicycles, and then they found deviations from those epicycles, and then they postulated more epicycles to account for those. And so that's kind of what's been going on in the economics discipline, where you have the neoclassical synthesis, you have the rational expectations model, and then you come up with these deviations, and then you go back into the, into the laboratory, and then you come up with more sophisticated models that account for those deviations. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is take it back to the very beginning and say, where do the preferences come from? And what mm -hmm. we find is that once we go and try to answer that question, all of these deviations are automatically explained. Your attempt to have a one-sentence summary of this in the proposal. Bayesian modeling of cognitive process to elicit scientific explanations for the formation of human preferences. So tell me about this. So this is the idea that you're, when you say the way you're going to explain human preferences, it's this business about Bayesian modeling, how people learn their preferences, how people learn their probabilities. Precisely. So there's one additional aspect to this, which is that everybody agrees that we learn what we do. But if you want to be able to predict what somebody will do, and if you want to do this on a macro level, then everybody has to be learning their preferences in the same way. Because if they don't, then the preference formation process is idiosyncratic. But we have an additional hypothesis that they learn these preferences in a way that minimizes the amount that they have to think, that minimizes how much metabolic costs their brain incurs in forming these preferences. This is the cognitive limitations part. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's the key content of the proposal is we're, we're saying that everybody learns what to do in the same way. So even though they learn to do different things because their history of experience with things is different, they learn it in the same way. And so you can rationalize 
and you can generalize and you can build predictive models of behavior, not at the level of action, but at the level of preference formation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a more, in a way, well, it's more fundamental. So you're, instead of resting on, we're not going to question utility functions, you're resting on where we have this idea about how everyone forms their preferences. At the same time, we are trying to be careful in retaining utility functions and other economic artifacts. So the point is that economic theory is good because yeah. there's this epistemic divide. They say, once you've given us the preferences, then we know what to do with them. But where you need the preferences to go in, there you want the effects of history, the effects of learning, the effects of individual differences in the ability to learn mm. to make a difference in the, in the input to the economic models. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build foundations for... Now, when you say you're trying to build this, this involves um, rats in mesas? This involves uh, lab experiments on people or yeah. these computer simulation things? College or? students in mesas, basically. Yeah. So now I just want to ask you a little bit about how you came to be doing this fascinating work. Mm -hmm. um, you were originally educated as an electrical engineer um, in, in India. I was. And how does that, how does somebody like that, okay, wind up putting students through rats and mazes? Um, serendipity. Serendipity, okay. So what happened was, or well, what typically happens is that in India you're supposed to go to engineering school because then you make more money. Um, and so I wanted to do psychology, but I was supposed to go to engineering school. And then I had to struggle all the way to come back to running rats to me that I originally wanted to. Mm -hmm. So that's that story. So you were, I didn't realize that. Okay, so you were always interested in, in psychology in some way. Um, how did you manage to uh, make that switch? Um, and you went to Minnesota to do this PhD in computer science and psychology. So what happened was that while I was at IIT, my undergraduate institution in Madras, in, in Madras uh -huh. um, I tried to pick up uh, cybernetics and artificial intelligence-based projects, and so that oh, led me, mm -hmm. and that led me into um, trying to predict behavior using control theory, using artificial intelligence, and so on. That took me into machine learning and learning theory, which is computer science, and so then that made the transition to computer science easier. And then once I made the transition into computer science, um, it was fairly straightforward to make this transition into actual learning. And uh, that led to the kind of uh, methods that we were using. And then once I found that they seemed to be giving me reasonable conclusions, then I realized that the best corpus of data for testing these models was economics data. So you've been in Minnesota for four years, something um, like that? I finished in five. five I years. just graduated um, three or four months ago. And so you're continuing, continuing on the work you did as a graduate student here with this project, with this grant? Well, I'm taking an year off and uh, uh -huh. climbing mountains again. And uh -huh. then I'll go back and continue the work. But we have some good mountains in the, in the United States, I think. Well, that's why I go there to yes. the West Coast very often. So I uh, thank you for coming today. And I really think this project has, seems like really very fascinating. And we're looking forward to seeing the results. The, uh, at INET, uh, uh, new economic thinking means new thinking about the economy, um, not necessarily by economists. Okay, but, uh, so I like to think of you as an INET economist. We welcome you to the stable of, of INET economists, if you'll have us. Oh, thank you very much. I accept gladly.